Hello, I'm Howard Stableford, and welcome to Concept Cars, where Adrian Bell and myself will be guiding you through the latest car designs and technologies. That's right, and this week it's the turn of the Europeans to impress with their design prowess. But you know, a concept car costs around a couple of million pounds a pop, so where do car companies recoup this cash? After all, just impressing journalists and public visitors at car shows isn't exactly going to boost the bottom line. So that's why the more sensible designers test out themes that they want feedback from in a concept, and then they go back to the design studio again to hone the curves and features with those comments in mind before a production version is launched. Remember the BMW 1 Series concept? We saw that at the Geneva Motor Show back in 2002, and everybody was excited by BMW's efforts in styling a sporty hatchback aimed at the guy who wasn't made of cash. Okay, they have the Mini, but this was a real BMW, for goodness sake. Although the concept had no roof, this was not going to be a roadster. Designer Chris Bangle told us that the lack of roof line was so that it wouldn't give too much away to rival companies. We, of course, think it was because he hadn't finished on time, but what the heck. The CS1 concept showed us a glimpse of what the new 1 Series would look like and asked the world for feedback. So here we are two years later, and this is the production version from that original concept. Let's check out the changes. It's obviously a hatch rather than a convertible now, and has touches of the excellent Z4 about it, a short front overhang, and your eye is taken on a roller coaster ride as you try and follow the complex surface lines across the car's body. From the rear, the car looks like a conventional hatch, but the overall package looks the business. This car is absolutely key for BMW's ambitions to get into volume production. Priced at under £16,000 and on sale from later on this year, the new 1 Series is meant to position in the Beamer lineup between the Mini and the 3 Series. The Compact was never very popular, seen as a cut-down 3 with dramatically reduced driving characteristics. Yet, BMW are going for a real gamble here. You see, with such a small car, most designers would go for a transverse front engine to save space. Front-wheel drive would be the norm, but not BMW. Oh no, they put the engine in a longitudinal mode, and the back wheels are driven, as in the rest of the BMW family. So in theory, a fantastic drive, albeit at a price of a cramped cabin and lack of luggage space. But, as we can see here, at least you can get a couple of big baskets of fresh fruit in the back. You wouldn't be able to do this in a Golf. But BMW tell us they're not competing with the Golf or Focus here. We're talking premium hatch here, where the Audi A3 has been cleaning up. But now BMW are on the scene, not with just this one series, but the same platform will spawn a saloon, a state, roadster, and a slightly larger two series coupe and convertible. With such a huge investment so critical on one model, no wonder the original concept was so important. Well, while BMW have their sights on taking over the planet, down the road from Munich in Rüsselheim, Opel seem to be having some fun. This quirky little car is called the Opel, or Vauxhall Trix with two X's for good measure. It looks like an extended smart from first glance, but the beauty is in the detail here. Look at these gorgeous lights and illuminated dash. Then there's the party trick that you'd be forever showing off in the pub car park. Wow, look at those opening doors and panels, so cool. And then the seat folding can begin. This car's good at folding things. It'd be the perfect transport to take you to an origami convention. We caught up with a car's designer and asked him to enthuse. And enthuse he did. The vehicle is very unusual in that it doesn't actually have a hatchback configuration. Access through the rear is gained through this third door on the passenger side and also through a drop glass on the rear. We also have a roof that goes forward so if there's any large or high loads this vehicle has that degree of flexibility also. The dash looks very attractive, but I'm not sure about this square steering wheel. Didn't you have the ill-fated Austin Allegro with one of these over in the UK, Howard? Oh, don't remind me. But there must be some reason why Opel decided to reinvent the wheel. Let's hear some more from the Trix's designer. As you can see, the interior is really focused around the driver, almost like a motorcycle with real energy and, and dynamism, which is one of the brand characteristics we really want to promote within Opel Vauxhall. Well, the designer is certainly enthusiastic about this new baby. 
The Trix is full of fun features, but you can be sure that wherever this concept is shown, General Motors staff are going to be watching very carefully from behind the one-way mirrors with their clipboards. That's right, there could be one feature, small or large, that the public will talk about, enthuse over and demand in their cars for the future. Car manufacturers may think they understand the public, but they don't really. Plus, they can't just ask people what they want to see in their cars, because they don't know what's possible or affordable. So that's why concepts like the Trix are made, to show off designs and features to test public reaction. I'd buy a Trix. I'd be the star of the pub car park. Hmm. Wouldn't that be the Fiat Pinto? Now they do say that the eyes of a car are the headlights, so that's why designers have to make them so attractive. These are the shots of the lights of a lovely new two-seater concept. Our French friends Renault have revealed this concept called the wind. The press release boasts flowing lines and the dynamism of chamfered contours. I don't know about that, but there are two defining design lines to me. The first goes along the sides, curving into the front and rear wings and sweeping round the wheel arches. The second line envelops the cabin, so the design seems to make it look very cosy inside for the driver. And that driver is cocooned in leather. Sitting on pleated leather seats, the driver has in front of him a circular, centrally mounted control panel where simplicity and ergonomics have taken priority. Wouldn't you love to get your feet on these shiny pedals? We caught up with Patrick Lequemont, Renault's chief designer, to find out more about the delightful wind concept. As in all the uh, concept cars that uh, we have developed in the past, it's a, a one-off running model which demonstrates where we're going from a design standpoint. Well, as such, it is highly realistic. Uh, the, the, the dimensions are realistic. Uh, the way that um, it is uh, manufactured uh, could be made uh, without any major change. Uh, as all the concept cars that we, we have done in the past, there is always something that remains. In the case of this one, for sure, uh, the uh, stylistic evolution that we're showing, which is with more cursive lines, with uh, flowing lines, with full uh, surfaces, that's something which you will definitely see in future uh, Renaults. With regards to manufacturing the roadster, that is another question. The chief designer from Renault, Monsieur Patrick Le Quemont. I like the wind, how about you? I agree, it looks great, but so did the Renault Spider back in the late 90s, and that didn't exactly sell well. So you think this is going to stay a concept? Afraid so. After recent troubles with the axing of the Renault Avant team, they won't be getting their fingers burnt again in a hurry. Well, this next concept looks certain to be a sure fire hit. With the new BMW 5 Series making its mark on 21st century roads, everybody has been asking what the next generation M5 will look like. This is the concept M5 with a V10 engine under the bonnet delivering 500 brake horsepower. This will get you to 60 in under 5 seconds. But we're not just talking raw power here. A whole lot of technologies from the BMW Williams Formula One team have been adapted into the M5. Adrian, would you like to tell the good people all about the high-tech highlights? Well, the Concept M5 has specially modified by Vanos camshaft timing, individual throttle butterflies, an enhanced DSC traction control system, a variable limited split differential, plus the engine electronics directly taken from the Formula One car. Blimey, they might as well have given you the pit stop crew as well. The heart of the BMW Concept M5 must be its exclusive high performance power unit with high revving air intake technology, an engine which sets a benchmark in this field. This engine has a 5 liter capacity, producing around 500 brake horsepower, and for the first time in BMW history, a series production saloon is to be powered by a 10-cylinder internal combustion engine, the sound and power of which is closely related to the engine currently providing monstrous power to the BMW Williams Formula One racing car, without a doubt the most powerful car on the starting grid. 
It's not the power alone that makes an M power unit so unique. The BMW Concept M5 stands out from others by having the most innovative drive concept in its class. Thanks to a superior gearbox, the driver can benefit from a completely new 7-speed SMG, a rapid manual gear shift and, if required, comfortable cruising. This piece of technical mastery also has its origins in Formula One. Have a look at these guys. They're setting up in a secret test location miles from anywhere. Inside this box is a 7 Series BMW, but not as we know it, Jim, uh, powered. So what makes this so different? And why test it miles from anywhere? And why has someone painted little kisses all over the bodywork? Well, this poor car is about to face a firing squad. Not for the crisp bangle design, which I must admit the jury is still out on, but to test how strong it is in these days of carjacking and terrorist activities. A 7 Series is, after all, the choice of many a top politician or celebrity. If a crazed gunman aimed their sights at this car, you'd want to know you'd be okay inside, wouldn't you? So let's take a targeted shot on the car, and a few more to be on the safe side. What about the ABC pillars? Or the glass? What about using a machine gun? Now I hear what you're saying. Open the door, and the Prime Minister, or whoever, will slump out and bleed all over the tarmac. But no. Inside, we see that the plush leather lining is not at all ruffled by this firing. All very impressive. So, how did they do that? Well, here in the Secret Security Department of BMW in Munich, we can show you the pictures of all the armour plating actually being fitted to the 7 Series. Bullet-resistant, reinforced passenger cells, strengthened door joints and triple glazing are all part of the customised security package customers can request. The glass is over 2 centimetres thick and includes a polycarbonate coating which acts as splinter protection for the passenger cell. Ballistic resistant steel panels are installed which can withstand a 44 Magnum attack. Plus, run flat tyres are put on as standard which can still work okay even when shot out. Here's one of the workers checking the weld lines for weaknesses. And the windscreen can also be used as an escape hatch if need be. And they've thought of undercar protection as well. Strong panels can resist blasts or bullets. But hang on a second. Adding all this nifty metalwork is going to make this car as nimble as a laden camel, isn't it? BMW claim they have similar performance and comfort, but I bet they drive round like a week shopping in the boot all the time. And by the way, if you're worried that eventually the secrets of these high security versions will be revealed to the baddies of the world, BMW have a buyback scheme so that used models don't end up in the underworld. Good thinking. OK, pay attention now, please. Listen carefully to what this nice Japanese gentleman is about to tell you. It's now the 21st century. So how are automobiles going to change? What if we thought of cars not as tools, but as partners? And what if, as the relationship deepened and the heart became involved, car and owner grew together? Excuse me? What the heck's he on about? Car and owner grow together. And can we really trust a man whose Japanese voice has been dubbed into American very badly? Let me introduce you. Personalization on demand. P.O.D. is here. Basically, the pod is a, is a design between, a collaboration between Sony and Toyota uh, to actually look into the future about how a car can actually react with a, its driver and also its occupants. It's a very, very clever innovation. It's actually driven, there's no steering wheel, it's actually driven and controlled via a uh, joystick on your, operated by your right hand. Um, and what this does, it actually picks up your pulse and your body's uh, levels of perspiration in your body and the reason it does that is to actually detect what kind of mood you're in so that the car can actually react and calm you down and have a calming influence and make you a safer driver and other drivers as well aware of your um, particular mood in the car and so for example if the car is going to be um, stuck in traffic it will actually warn ahead of your destination for example if you've got a meeting it will actually phone ahead and actually arrange that you will be late for that meeting and slow you down so you, it minimizes totally minimizes road rage as with all concept cars um, it's actually been built to gauge a public reaction so um, various aspects of it may be used in the future for other cars for, or even the pod itself who knows this is rather neat though flashing headlights as you know can mean anything from I'll let you go to get out of the way, you idiot. 
but the pod can actually talk to other pods using a variety of light, sound and radio signals. Plus, you can wag your tail at other cars. Does this mean you're a happy dog or an angry cat? Now, this is just getting silly. But, you know, I think I hate this function. The car senses if the driver's stressed, then automatically plays the driver's favourite music or a selection of soothing sound effects. Also, if the driver's favourite restaurant is nearby, it may display up on the screen the menu to tempt the driver to stop and to relax. Mmm, noodles! What it'll do is it'll actually um, slow the car down, actually um, switch on the air conditioning or even open the windows if necessary and actually play some soft soothing music so that it basically gives you a, a much sort of calmer ambience. The car even rewards good driving habits. Nanny state or what? It is, it, it, it is big brother definitely but particularly as the, uh, the thing which is called the pod is a, is a, a handheld controller and that can be placed inside your house. And for example, if um, you were with your family and you were going out for the day and you were talking about all the different places you'd like to go, it would actually pick up your um, conversation with this, uh, what we call dedicated short range communication. It will actually pick up information and when you're actually in the car, it will give you a scrolled view of things that you may have spoken about, places of interest for example, and play those on via the internet, play them on a scrolled uh, display. So I wonder, if you drive really badly, does the car automatically call the police and read you your rights through the loudspeaker? The car industry may think itself as global, but there are huge differences between vehicles designed for North America and for Europe. A lot of those differences stem from the vast difference in price and availability of fuel. No matter how often North Americans go on about how environmentally friendly they are, the fact is that the average North American punter is not going to be happy tootling about in a little one-liter Fiat Panda. The only panda we can easily see is how the big automotive companies panda to the punter's tastes in the States and continue to produce gas-guzzling brutes. But even though it seems that General Motors in Detroit doesn't give a monkeys about saving gas, General Motors in Europe seem to be obsessed with being very frugal with their precious fuel. Let's pay a quick visit to Opel in Rüsselheim, Germany, where they're very proud of their Eco Speedster. First up, this runs on diesel, not petrol. This spectacular prototype marks the start of the biggest diesel campaign in Opel's history, as they set out to prove that you could get a very sporty performance machine from the tiniest amount of fuel. During initial testing, the 112 brake horsepower concept car reached a maximum speed of over 255 kilometers an hour. That's 155 miles per hour, while fuel consumption was a miserly 2.5 liters per 100 kilometers. That is incredible. The two-seat prototype is based on the mid-engine Speedster Roadster, but features new carbon fiber bodywork with much improved aerodynamics. With significantly reduced drag and even lower weight, the Eco Speedster takes up where another Opel prototype left off 30 years ago. On June 1, 1972, at the company's Dudenhofen Proving Ground, a modified Opel GT with a 95 horsepower, 2.1 liter turbocharged diesel engine made the headlines by setting several world records for diesel passenger cars and reached a top speed of 197.5 kilometers an hour. The new Eco Speedster is proof of the progress made in the last 30 years and of the diesel engine's amazing passenger car career. When the record-breaking GT made its sensational appearance, it was the first time that sports car performance had been associated with the diesel engine. This latest concept from General Motors' Opel branch shows how a new generation is being shown how being frugal with fuel doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have fun. After the success of the Xara rally car, Citroen have unveiled this concept called the C4 Sport as its replacement. Our initial brief was to make um, uh, a show car that would be an image of uh, the replacement of the Xara rally car. So um, a car that's very muscly, very uh, sports orientated and with a strong personality. 
uh, eventually will be the replacement of the Xara uh, rally car uh, in, an, in a future which is yet to define. There are some cars which have enormous difficulties in adapting for a rally environment. It's usually the suspension which is a pain to adjust. But the C4 concept is based on a tested platform. Well, this car is already on a platform that suits the, um, the rally regulations, I would say. Uh, the Xara was exactly the, the, the kind of car, the size of car that suits the World Rally Championship regulations. And uh, this one being on the same base, on the same platform, uh, will be as easy to make. For Citroen, this car is important to project a positive image of the company's sporting aspirations. The promotion of the, of the brand through, uh, through the rally championship uh, is important, uh, especially when you win the, the championships. So uh, last year we, uh, we were world champion uh, of car manufacturers and we used this opportunity to make uh, this C4 Citroen Sport concept car. Uh, to emphasize the, we, our involvement in the, in the championship. But you've got to admit, at the end of the day, no matter how good the car is, it's the drivers and the team that make winners in the rally world. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this week's Concept Cars. Join Adrian and myself next time for some more beautiful, bizarre, or just plain balmy creations. Take care. See you soon.